Three hearings this week will build on the previous 10 hearings during which we've considered the governor's January budget plan, numerous proposals for investment and heard from hundreds of Californians who shared their experiences and opinions. Um, I think it's important that you all know um, from my perspective as well as that of my colleagues, Senators Monning and Stone, that we heard you. And we understand that health and human services and the budget decisions we make in this committee um, have real life, life and death impacts on hundreds of thousands of Californians and, and we take our jobs very seriously to that end. So what's new? The governor's new spending plan includes 6.7 billion in higher than expected revenues from the growing state's economy. That's the good news. And I think the, the from my perspective, the reality of the May revise um, is mixed news. There's good news from the perspective of the inclusion of an earned income tax credit that's targeted to lowest income Californians and it's refundable. Uh, an IHSS increase from current year. Um, the proposed plan for the closure of the developmental centers by 2018 um, through DDS. But some priorities um, that we've heard in this committee and colleagues have expressed desires uh, about were not included. Uh, no across the board increase, uh, increase um, for DSS. Uh, in CalWORKs, no COLA or grant increase, no reference to the maximum family grant, no mention of the 24 month clock. Child welfare, we saw nothing. Uh, early care and education, we saw some increases, um, but no significant new investment in the expansion of much needed child care slots um, or increase for reimbursement rates. And in SSI, we saw nothing. I think that's a very high level summary, colleagues, of what the May revise included um, in the areas uh, within our purview here in sub three. I believe the legislature has uh, a responsibility to reinvest in the human services and safety net programs that offer families, seniors, and members and, 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 and Californians living, living with developmental disabilities a fighting chance to live beyond the desperate demands of the moment and invest in California's critical, critical future. Furthermore, um, I have to say um, some of the statements about poverty the governor made in his press conference gave me real cause for pause. He did outline, outline a choice, the earned income tax credit, but it's a single choice. Um, and I think um, that we've got to look at a more strategic, broader approach if we are going to be serious about reducing the number of Californians, be they children, or seniors who are living at and below poverty. The governor said that we could do not do better than this for low income families unless we establish what he called the quote, English styled welfare state of 20 years ago, end quote. And we know that uh, based on actual testimony in both this subcommittee and the select committee on women and inequality that I chair, um, that there is actually a more recent successful British strategy for cutting specifically child poverty in half. The governor in his press conference also cited a book that he's reading from November 1969. Uh, the title was The President's Commission on Income Maintenance Programs and the specific report is Poverty Amid Plenty, The American Paradox. Um, since the war on poverty was introduced in January of 1964, I think that we now have 50 years of experience rather than five. And I would argue a more developed understanding of how poverty um, can be reduced effectively. So I hope that we can continue to hear from expert policy advocates, people um, um, from the DD community, people living in poverty, seniors who are attempting to live on the no COLA SSI program that we operate here in the state so we can have a California-based, reality-based experience about what Californians are attempting to do um, to survive um, in our golden state and the land of plenty. Again, for a parent with two children, $19,000 a year is where the federal government draws the line defining household poverty, and deep poverty is at $9,500 a year in California. Um, clearly, uh, the EITC program and individual efforts 
alone will not stave off hunger, homelessness, or hopelessness from a family who's trying to live on, on those meager resources. Um, again, we believe uh, a robust investment in early care and education is a critical part of a true poverty alleviation strategy. And so we're hoping that leadership um, will step up to the plate. Uh, it's clearly needed um, in an effort to have a meaningful conversation about investment for all vulnerable communities across the state of California. Uh, uh, these are the principles that I'll use as we continue to hold the final sub three hearings. And I look forward to hearing from and continuing to work collaboratively with my colleagues, the administration, the various state agencies, the LAO and advocates as we craft smart, innovative and effective investments and in policies for a state that we can all be proud to lead and live in. Uh, any of my other colleagues like to make any opening remarks as we begin our post May revise sub three hearings? I appreciate that, sir. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, the first part of our agenda um, will be um, vote only. We're going to go ahead and get started with um, the Office of Systems Integration, the Cal Here's Adjustment. We're on page four of the agenda. Let me adjust my numerous pieces of paper here so I see what I am doing. And so the uh, subcommittee staff recommendation is to approve. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. You okay with that, sir? Okay. Um, just, uh, I just reiterate um, my concern. Um, Hang on one second. We're going to get your mic on because I have no controls here. I'm going to support the motion. I'm just reiterating my concern about the cost escalations of IT within the, the state. I'm hoping that uh, we're not going to see another uh, cost like this for this particular program, certainly in the magnitude that we're seeing here today. So, Thank you very much. And so that's out uh, on a 3-0 vote. Moving on to California Health Facilities Financing Authority, uh, number one, Investment in Mental Health Wellness Act of 2013, page five of the agenda. So moved. And we, we, we are um, accepting proposed placeholder trailer bill language. We, we have to invest in mental health services of the state and the county level, so I'm very- e Excellent. Thank you, sir. Um, though that also was out on a 3-0 vote. Moving on to 4260 Department of Health Care Services. Number one, the May 2015 Medi-Cal estimate. Sorry. Department of Finance issue 501 and 502. Uh, staff recommendations for approval. Sorry. And is that on a 3-0? No vote at this time. Okay, that's on a 2-0 vote. Thank you. Item two, uh, the estimate of the cost of living adjustment for county eligibility administration. I'll move it. And this is the item that we're going to hold open. We are. Again, repeating the elimination of the uh, cost of living adjustment for county eligibility administration. We're going to hold that item open. Item three, child health and disability prevention program dental referral. Move. Recommendation is to adopt placeholder trailer bill language. Move it. That's out on a 3-0. Item four, health care reform workload extension. Recommendation is to approve. Move it. 3-0 recommendation. Item five, Medi-Cal annual open enrollment period. Um, the recommendation is to reject. The legislature has denied similar proposals in the last few years because it found that it's important to ensure that Medi-Cal enrollees have the ability to change health plans at any time to ensure that his or her health Care needs are met. Move to reject. Madam Chair, I'm going to uh, not support the motions. So I'll be the no. I, I think it should be in line with our private plans and having open enrollment once a year. Thank you. That's out. The rejection on a two to zero vote. Two to one. Sorry. Two to one. Item number six, Cal Here's electronic MAGI determination trailer bill language. Uh, recommendation is to adopt placeholder trailer bill language. Move it. Three to zero. 
Item 7, Healthcare Reform Financial Reporting Resources. Staff recommendation is to approve. So moved. Madam Chair, I'm going to vote no, uh, not because it's not the appropriate thing to vote yes, but it's just a, it's a protest vote with the federal government that just places so many mandates on us for federal funds. I know you support the you philosophy the of the no vote, yes, so it's, just a, no, it's a no protest vote. All right, so that's out two to one. Item number eight, hospital quality assurance fees resources. The recommendation is to approve. That's out three to zero. Item number nine, MLK hospital resources. Recommendation is to approve. Three to zero. Item 10, meds and securing Medi-Cal eligibility information resources. Recommendation is to approve. Three out with a three to zero recommendation. Item number 11, Intergovernmental Transfer Program Resources. Recommendation is to approve. 3-0 RECO. Item 12, Drug Medi-Cal Provider Enrollment. Recommendation is to approve. 3-0 RECO. Item 13, Drug Medi-Cal Provider Monitoring. Recommendation is to approve. 3-0. Item 14, Substance Abuse Recovery and Treatment Services, AB 2374 of the 2014 stat, um, um, statute. Recommendation is to approve. Strongly approve it. 3-0 recommendation. Item number 15, Performance Outcome Systems for EPSDT Medi-Cal Specialty Mental Health Services. Recommendation is approval. 3-0. Item number 16, Family Health Programs Adjustments, Finance Issues 505, 505-MR, and 505-506-MR. Recommendation is approval. 3-0. Item 17, Modify um, the Mr. MIP Recommendation is to reject proposed trailer bill language. As previously discussed, the proposal gives DHCS broad authority to redesign Mr. MIP without any input from stakeholders, and it eliminates a safety net option whereby individuals could purchase health coverage throughout the year if they miss the open enrollment period for commercial coverage. Move to reject. Um, the motion is to reject on a three to zero recommendation. Two one. I'm sorry. Two, the, the, the down was not. To, no, got it. Two one. We got to get our sign language straight. I'm <laughs> sorry. All right. So that's out on a two to one recommendation to object. Moving on to the Department of Public Health, item 4265, number one, genetic disease screening program update, AB 1559. The uh, recommendation is approve the genetic disease screening program estimate and budget change proposal. And that is out on a three to zero recommendation. Office of AIDS, ADAP client eligibility verification resources. The recommendation is approved. That's out with a three to zero recommendation. Item three, ADAP modernization. The recommendation is to adopt placeholder trade bill language um, to modernize ADAP as referenced in the agenda. Uh, that's out with a two to one recommendation. And the final item under Department of Public Health is item four, May revision estimate updates, Department of Finance issues 400, et cetera. The recommendation is to approve. That's out with a three to zero recommendation. Thank you, colleagues. We'll now move into the items for discussion in today's agenda, starting on page seven of the agenda. I mean page 14. <laughs> that's, why it's, that's why it's three of us, right. <laughs> Where did I get seven from? I just made it up. Oh yes, exactly. That's what happens when I move. Folks are coming up here, right? So, uh, item 4260, Department of Healthcare Services. We'll start with the first item, 2111, Realignment Behavioral Health Growth Account Allocation. We'll have LAL come up here if they needed to. We have enough space for everybody? 
Good morning. Good morning. Hopefully that's on. Is this on? Yep, I can oh, hear you. Great. So good morning. I'm Karen Baylor, Deputy Director of Mental Health Substance Use Disorders for the Department of Healthcare Services. I have um, Marlise Perez with me, who is the Division Chief for Substance Use Compliance, and Brenda Graylish, who is the Assistant Deputy Director and, and sometimes Division Chief for Mental Health Services. So <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to come before you and talk about realignment. So we'll start there. Um, there is 60 million in realignment growth from 1213 that we need to distribute. Um, we have had uh, some meetings with the Department of Finance, uh, CBHDA, the, the Directors Association, and CSAC to determine um, what factors should be considered in distributing the funds. I've also had conversation with three of the um, most active and interested stakeholders in this process and have received letters uh, regarding what they think the factors should be in distributing the funds. Um, and we haven't landed anywhere yet. We're still discussing, we're still reviewing, um, we're still talking. What we had done was run the claims data through December, and that gave us only six months worth of claims um, it, to distribute the funds like we did last year. Uh, but we decided that looking at it, we weren't looking at a complete picture, and so we wanted to run the claims through uh, March 31st to see nine months. And so now we're comparing the two reports to see there's more counties that are looking like they've um, overexpended and some counties are looking like they're underexpended. And so we want to take some time to really look at that and evaluate the differences. If we waited until June 30th, where, all, where we'd have one year's worth of claims, then that means that the 60 million would go out later in the year and we normally distribute it during this period of time. So we're still taking a look at it and um, we'll continue to uh, have conversations and, and gather input until uh, we make a final determination and recommendation for how to distribute the funds. So the three uh, entities that we have spoken with has been Rusty Selix's group, CCCMHA, Carol Schroeder in the Child Family Alliance, and with Patrick Gardner, who's an advocate. It looks like there's a question. Uh, if you uh, would answer question number four on page 15 of the agenda, what's your view on how the growth account funding could be used to incentivize counties to increase utilization? Sure, we're still taking a look at that. I think there's several options at, on the table for us. Um, and so we still haven't made any final determinations. Um, we did say last year that um, a first call on growth would be the entitlements. We're now getting ready to implement and roll out a drug Medi-Cal waiver. And so of course that's very important to us as well. And so we're really taking a look at all of the different factors that have been given to us and, and really take a look at that more in depth. Um, one of the other things we really want to do and, and has, have had conversations with Rusty about this as well is looking at realignment is just one piece of the picture. You really don't see the entire mental health system unless you look at 91 realignment, 2011 realignment, any grant funding, and um, MHSA. And so one of the things our staff is working on right now is really gathering by county all of the funding sources so that we can get a really broad picture of that funding. And even when you do that, you mentioned, you know, grant funding, making sure that it's, you know, not, you're not counting grant funds that are, that are time limited. So it's really a real- Correct, thing. we're looking at SAMHSA funds. What is your current uptake rate? I'm sorry. What is the current uptake rate of counties? On, I'm not sure I understand the question. Wait, say it one more time. Specialty mental health. Well, um, we're seeing growth because of um, also because of KDA, um, and we're seeing some growth. Um, we we I know anecdotally you still hear about some of the providers saying that EPSDT is capped. We've spent a lot of time talking to the directors about how it's not capped. And so we've taken that a step further where we're now meeting with Rusty and, and his providers with uh, the California Behavioral Health Directors Association with some of theirs so that we can drill down to find out where this is coming from. 
Whenever someone says to us that it's been capped and we know specifically what county it is, we investigate to find out what's going on. And we usually find something different than EPSDT is being capped. But we understand that that is still out there in California and we're trying to get to the bottom of where that's being perpetuated to reassure folks that it is an entitlement and there is an obligation to meet that entitlement. So you mentioned these stakeholder groups that you are engaging. Um, are there any stakeholder groups who represent the actual clients who uh, utilize the services? Uh, like, no, there hasn't been. Uh, and will there be? We can definitely do that. We did have a stakeholder call um, several months ago where we sent it out to about 2,000 people. And yeah, so we've had a stakeholder call, but I haven't especially, you know, reached out to just a stakeholder or a client group. I, I, I ask that you would, given, sure. given, the, uh, given all that's at risk, um, I think that, that would be appropriate, that would be helpful. But sure. I'm sure that's who we're going to hear from in public comment today. Happy to do so. Any other? Yes, Senator Stone. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you talked about uh, counties that uh, overspend and underspend. Um, is, do you see any kind of a nexus to urban counties versus rural counties? Because I can tell you in Riverside County, which has historically over the past decade been the fastest growing county in the state and the second fastest growing in the country, that we've seen a tremendous uh, demand for mental health services, especially you know, within our jails, within our, our growing uh, homeless population. And while I appreciate the $60 million being allocated and also serving on the mental health caucus here, I can tell you that's very pale in comparison probably to the need that the counties are providing. And um, I'm sure we'll probably hear from some counties today that you know, this is just not enough. And so I was just curious if you, if you saw any kind of disparity versus the rural versus urban counties. I would assume the urban counties are the ones that spent it all and maybe the rural counties are the ones that maybe had a little bit left over. Yeah, uh, just we haven't really had enough time to really delve down deep into the the um, the data and the numbers yet. But that's our plan is to look to see if there is any themes um, across the state. Okay, and, and in hearing from the counties, is there? And maybe again, we'll hear from them. But I would be curious to know what they think this number should appropriately be in order to provide the services that are needed throughout the state of California. I would assume they're much more than sixty million dollars. I would imagine that as well. Being a former director, there was never enough money. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and I think it's a twofold issue: uh, enough money and, and how and the methodology that's used. I think that the methodology has always been kind of the hiccup as we've gone through, you know, realignment one, grandson, great grandson. <laughs> um, and so the methodology is, is always what's so critical, which is why having all the appropriate stakeholders at the table is critical too, so everyone's vo voice is heard. So I agree with you, Senator. Senator Monty. I know you're doing stakeholder outreach. Have you heard from any counties from patients or families where they're filed complaints that they've been denied um, support through the EPSDT? No, if we do hear of anything, we do drill down, but um, we haven't heard. There's been no spike or anything no. out of the, I mean, we have our usual process that we, we go through. There is a mechanism if you hear. Mm -hmm. To follow up on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, finance, LAO. Uh, public comment, please, on item one. Come to the mic on the right. As they're approaching, let me just announce uh, that we fully expect that today's hearing uh, will run until 2 o'clock. Senate goes into session. Uh, what we'll do is adjourn, we'll, we'll take a recess of the committee. Uh, and I will announce on the floor uh, upon adjournment uh, of the Senate session today what time we intend to reconvene in this room after um, se session is over. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. Adrienne Shilton representing the County Behavioral Health Directors Association. We represent the public behavioral health authorities in counties throughout the state. So just in the way of background, in 2011 realignment, counties assume the state share of costs for, among other things, EPSDT, which is an entitlement program, 
And the original goal of this program was to use the growth funds to reimburse counties for EPSDT claims in excess of the, of the, uh, excess of the amount and the, and the balance of those um, funds would be redistributed across all of the counties. And unfortunately, to date, we haven't been able to obtain a clear 12-month picture of EPSDT claims. So we recently reviewed spreadsheets, as Dr. Baylor mentioned, at the six month and then again at nine months. And the change associated with that was 100%. So you, as you can imagine, we would probably see additional changes as we look at the, tw at the full 12-month uh, spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. So the, um, in, our, in our proposal, um, Basically, this under a county of claims means that counties that have legitimate claims that are unaccounted for at the, both the six and the nine month uh, period suffer a double hit if EPSDT is paid before all of the counties receive their growth funds. So they don't get reimbursed for EPSDT claims and they actually receive less of the growth overall. So our recommendation before the committee today is, is to um, have the full $60 million distributed across all of the counties according to a, a distribution formula that we've worked on with uh, DHCS. Thank you very much. Next witness. Uh, th thank you for this opportunity to make a few comments. My name is Patrick Gardner. I'm with the Young Minds Advocacy Project. Um, and I put together some uh, prepared remarks, but I'd also be happy to answer a couple of, uh, address some of the questions that the members have 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 raised. Um, um, so let me let me just go through my prepared remarks very quickly. The um, oh yes, please. Uh, so uh, the issue of uh, allocating behavioral health subaccount funds is uh, seems to be simple on its face. It's a it's a straight sort of math uh, 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 proposition whereby the funds are proposed uh, through the latest county proposal to simply be uh, allocated based upon past spending. Um, it seems pretty straightforward, but there, as you might imagine, is a rather substantial catch. Um, and the catch is this. Every county in California has made a legal commitment to the state and a corresponding promise um, to California's children and families to meet the state's obligations under federal Medicaid law to provide or arrange for timely mental health treatment in the scope, duration, and intensity necessary to correct or ameliorate every eligible child's mental health condition. It's called an entitlement because uh, you must provide those services to every child who's eligible for them. Um, this obligation is often referred to e uh, as EPSDT, and it's essentially the Children's Mental Health uh, Program under Medi-Cal. Um, the program is administered by county mental health plans using the behavioral health subaccount funds along with matching funding from the federal government. Thus, the $60 million that we're talking about today will be matched with an additional $60 million of federal dollars. So we're actually talking about $120 million in services statewide. Here's the challenge. I don't believe there is a single county in California that is fully complying with the EPSDT obligations under law. Um, you don't need to take my word for it. All you have to do is look at the history of litigation in the state of California over this program and other entitlement programs to see that there is this constant concern and ultimately the courts um, um, have, have agreed that these children aren't getting the services that they need. And when children don't get the services that they need, we have things like uh, failure in school, we have high numbers of children that go into foster care. We have children that end up in, in the, de the delinquency system, uh, detained or hospitalized. We have children who end up homeless and we have children who kill themselves. Um, so the question is, what, what does this have to do with the behavioral health growth subaccount? Under realignment 2011, the legislature essentially gave the Department of Finance unfettered discretion to allocate what is now over a billion dollars a year among the counties um, to pay for uh, a variety of mental health programs. Um, the largest one in this uh, batch is, of course, the EPSDT Children's Mental Health Program. Um, now, essentially what the counties are, are asking is the Department of Finance also waive its discretion and simply hand over the dollars uh, as business as usual, which is to say, whatever they spent last year, We'll look at the proportion of the total and we'll hand them th those dollars uh, based upon that proportion. Um, just to be clear, 
Um, the whole behavioral health fund isn't the issue today. It's really only this growth that's left over from last fiscal year. Um, it's about 6% of the total funds that, are, that will be allocated in this fiscal year to the, uh, under the behavioral health uh, realignment. Um, and the Department of Finance has already allocated 94% of the total um, using the formula that the counties are proposing now. That's already, uh, it's also important to note that $60 million in growth funds have already been given to the counties. The 60 million we're talking about now is from last year, but they got that same growth this year. So they're already getting more money than they got last year. Um, and they're getting it in the same way that they're proposing this additional growth funds be allocated. Um, so essentially what the counties want is they want to continue business as usual um, by distributing these funds with no strings attached, no guidance from either the Department of Finance or the legislature, and no accountability for meeting their obligations under Medi-Cal. And your recommendation would be? What? Our recommendation is that either the legislature or the Department of Finance or the Department of Healthcare Services or stakeholders should identify clear policy goals that we want to have accomplished and then use the funds to incentivize those policy goals. For example, um, right now, the question was asked, what are the penetration rates? What's access to care in the state of California? Well, access to care in the state of California varies dramatically depending upon where you happen to live. And there was already the allusion to the, to the fact that Riverside often doesn't have the resources and the services to provide for the children uh, that live in Riverside County. Well, it's absolutely true. In Fresno, the penetration rate is uh, just over about 4%. In Butte County, it's over um, 13%. So that means that children in Fresno County are one third as likely to get any access to care um, under the Medi-Cal program than children in Butte County. This disparity in access to services is not only bad for kids, it's also unlawful. Under the Medicaid statute, the requirement is that all children who are eligible for services must be provided them. It strains credulity to think that the children in Fresno County are one third as needy as the children in Butte County, or, uh, or the children in Alameda County are two and a half times more needy than the children in Fresno County. So what we're proposing is that we use these growth funds to fund, uh, improved access to care in counties that have historically um, not had the resources um, to meet the needs of their population. Okay. And the good news is, is there's enough money in the, in the pipeline now, and it will grow dramatically next year to meet this requirement without penalizing any of the higher performing counties. So we think that your oversight powers ought to be used to advance key policy goals. And let's face it, to limit future litigation because the state has once again failed to meet its obligations under Medicaid law. Similar situation was with KDA. KDA, the counties have reported themselves that there are roughly 20,000 children, 18 to 20,000 children who are eligible for these intensive services. And right now, the state's capacity to provide those services is less than 4,000 children at any given moment. And yet it looks as though the growth in KDA has stalled. So once again, we are in this situation where the state has made promises to deliver services. We're not doing it. It's a violation of federal law, and yet we're not tying the money that's going out to counties in the tens of millions of dollars to those goals um, those priorities, and honestly, to those children and families. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I want the rest of the folks to understand that this was kind of our first kind of hearing from the perspective of children, and EPSDT is for children. So I don't want everyone else in line to think you're going to get that kind of <laughs> liberal treatment. Uh, thank you for the historical piece. Just to kind of put it all in context for us, that was important, but that's why I wanted to say, now, what's your recommendation? I was clear what status quo is. So everyone else, closer to two minutes. And one last point is we uh, did 
uh, read a letter to DHCS Great. to lay this out. Great. Um, and we have a letter to the Department of Finance that's going to go out in the next day or so that actually gets down to dollars and cents so folks can take a look at it and say, what would happen to my county under the county proposal? What would happen in my county under this alternative proposal? And I can assure you that places like Riverside and Fresno and some of the counties that have been overlooked in the past will do much better um, if we focus on these goals of improving access to care um, statewide. Thank you, Mr. Gardner, and thank you for your written testimony that we can refer to as well. Uh, Senator Stone, a thank question you. to Mr. Gardner or just a no, statement? Um, thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak. Uh, DHS, I, I'd like you to have the opportunity to, to respond about the disparity of services that uh, Mr. Gardner uh, very appropriately uh, articulated. And obviously under Medicare law with entitlements, we're, we are supposed to provide these services to those that are in need. And it's my concern that um, we have children, especially, that may not be getting the services that they're entitled to. Um, do you agree with the comments of the speaker? And if you do, what um, policies do you suggest that we utilize in this next round of funding to ensure that we don't have this disparity? It, and um, we have reviewed um, Patrick's letter that he sent to the department with his recommendations. I think that's part of the process that we're going through now is to look at the six-month data versus the nine-month data. Um, while penetration rate is a factor, it's only one factor. And I think, um, once again, we're trying to gather all the information so that we can work with our other partners uh, in the administration to come up with a real solid um, uh, recommendation. Um, I, I'm one of those, I've been in this field for 30 years, I will never think that every child has been served or that there's ever gonna be enough money. Um, but at the same time, I don't wanna be labeling children who uh, could be served in the managed care system under um, mild to moderate. And so I think we need to take a step back and look at the entire picture, I, and not just look at one section. And, and I appreciate your explanation and, and agree that there's never enough resources to take care of everybody, but we need to have some type of a homogeneous policy that makes the attempt Agreed. to make sure that we help as many children by a formula that can't be criticized by one county saying, hey, listen, you know, you got 4% being, uh, uh, being given these resources and 13% in another county. There needs to be some defensible formula to protect the state, certainly from litigation, but more importantly, to make sure that there's a, there's a consistent policy throughout the state in helping these young children, so. Understood, thank you. 